Okay, welcome everyone to this continuation of my What is Linear Algebra series. Today I want to talk about a little bit uh, more about, uh, more sorry, talk about a little bit about the more abstract concept, the exterior algebra. Um, the exterior algebra is a little bit mysterious if you see it for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I'm basically trying to motivate its definition, show you some of its properties, and hopefully you're not scared anymore when you see the, the exterior algebra. Certainly I was very scared when I, when I met it for the first time. It has a really strange looking definition. That's a very powerful concept and it comes up very naturally. Uh, if you think about it a little bit, I mean, people don't come up with those definitions out of the blue. They have something in mind they want to prove. And in, for the exterior algebra, it's, it's, it's one of these instances of mathematics where over time, the definition gets more and more obscure um, because it, it's polished more and more. People polish it, polish it, polish it until it looks uh, shiny like a crystal, but then you can't see where it comes from anymore. Also, it, it, it's then very mysterious why it, it's useful and why it's why so, so many calculations will involve it. Um, and today I'm going basically, as I said, trying to explain where it comes from um, and how you work with it. So what I'm going to tell you might differ a little bit of uh, what, do you, what do you see in your in some lecture or reading some textbook. But don't worry, it's it really is the same. So the idea is actually pretty simple. The idea is, um, at, at least how I would describe it, that you have something that most mathematicians really like, polynomials. OK, polynomials. Um, Let's just say polynomials. I don't care so much for the round field, in, in, as you probably know from my other videos. So let's say polynomials with real coefficients. Uh, let's say you have three variables. So polynomials don't have, don't necessarily need to be just in one variable, right? You can have multiple variables. You can just form polynomials out of them, um, whatever. So uh, my variables are x1, x2, x3. You can also call them X, Y, Z if you want, or whatever. And you could write down things like this, X1, uh, so X, Y, Z squared plus uh, X, Z cubed, something like that. That would be a polynomial in multiple variables. And how you would define it is you kind of have some, some notion of a free algebra and free symbols. It's basically, you can write down all words in x1, x2, x3. So all kind of concatenation of those symbols. And you just divide by, well, variables commute, which basically means if you see something like x, y, then it is the same as y, x. As all of you know it from standard polynomials, just now I have, might have more variables. That's basically it. And all of algebra in one way or the other is about polynomials. So people love it a lot and it's very useful. And basically all functions that exist um, in, in some reasonable way uh, are polynomials. That's of course not quite true. There are functions that are not polynomials, but they are very close to being polynomials. And we can say quite a lot about polynomials. They turn up everywhere. They encode real life problems and so on and so on. And they're very nice. Okay. Um, and the only main idea I want to keep you in mind with respect to the exterior algebra is that you use exactly the same definition. So you write down those things here. Um, but now you impose the relations that variables anti commute. That means if you have x, y, and you want to swap them, you want to write them in the opposite order, then you pick up a sign. So it's minus y, x. That's it. That's the only definition. And I call this the exterior algebra. In, in this case, in three variables, um, I really the, the main difference is that I impose the two, uh, two variables anti-commute. And it really makes a huge difference. Um, 
it looks very innocent. In some sense, it actually doesn't make a huge difference. It's all the calculations are kind of the same, but then there are some, some subtle instances which in the end make a huge difference. Um, so the definition, I say it again, polynomials, but now if you swap two variables, you pick up a sign. For example, I just did a multiplication table of uh, two, two polynomials here. A uh, very easy a1, x1, a2, x2, a3, x3. I take the sum of them and I multiply it with b1, x1, b2, x2, uh, and b3, x3. I knew what would you would down, it's a polynomial, right? You would down, uh, what, what you would write down, it's a polynomial. So you would write down a multiplication table. And it will look like this, right? So on the diagonal, at least in this, in, in this illustration, you would see squares of the generators turning up. You would have x1 squared, because that's the part where you multiply, let's say, this guy with this guy. So a1, b1, x1 squared. On the upper part of the diagonal, so, so above the diagonal, the green part, and there will be a uh, below the diagonal part, the red part, you will see uh, mixed products but kind of always ordered in this case, um, always something like that the, 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 the lower index is to the left. So something like uh, xi, xj with i smaller than j. That's basically what it means to be on the, on the upper side of the diagonal. On the lower side of the diagonal, you will kind of see the same expressions, but now kind of xj, xi, and i is still smaller than j. Okay. And in the usual setup, you would multiply those polynomials, you would collect all the terms, you will get this result. Right? You get the diagonal, which is in, in purple here. Um, and you get the off-diagonal terms, which you can just collect under the symmetry of transposition. So you have the green terms and you have the, the red terms in front of the same element, because, well, let's just say, uh, let's just focus on this one, x3, x1, and x1, x3 are just the same element. Right? The polynomial ring, they're just the same because I have imposed the relation that variables count. In the exterior algebra, you would do exactly the same nonsense, but now because x3, x1 is actually minus x1, x3, you will pick up a sign in between red and uh, uh, green. And as I will explain in a second, or, or uh, well, the, 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 these terms die. Why? Well, let's see. So x1, x1, by definition, is so x1 squared is minus, is, is oh, oh, now I got it wrong. It's actually minus x1, x1. And that's bad. If, if you have x1, x1 equals minus x1, x1, then, then you actually have x1, x1 is zero. So all of the diagonal terms die. And all of the off-diagonal terms, you have to be careful uh, in what order you write them, because there's a sign. In, in what I'm going to show you, I always prefer kind of the, the green part. So I write everything in terms of the green part. So x1, x2, not x2, x1. And I will get signs in, in, in this order. But that's really the only thing. That, that's the definition of the exterior algebra. And that, that's it in some sense. Um, just observation, you like polynomials, or maybe you don't, but a lot of people like polynomials. They're super helpful. I hope you like, I really hope you like polynomials. Polynomials are great. Um, and they're super helpful. And the only difference is you throw in a sign whenever you have your two variables. And I hope our exposition was clear enough that this works for any, any number of variables, right? You can have 504 variables. You just throw in the sign whenever you, whenever you uh, uh, swap the order. And actually where it comes from is it's, it's a geometric, like um, um, the determinant is a geometric, we'll see the determinant later, in about five minutes. The determinant is a geometric, uh, object and the exterior algebra is also a geometric object. So, for example, um, in, in the calculation I did here, what you would observe is that what you get are exactly the same rules as for the so called cross product, which you probably have seen at one point in your life. Uh, the cross product between two vectors 
in R3, for example, is just, you have one vector, let's say V, you have another vector. Maybe I should put this vector in black as it is in the illustration. Um, you have another vector in blue, W, and up to a sign, there is a vector orthogonal to it. You, you can take your left or your right hand, depends on that, that's basically the difference of the sign. So um, your, your thumb and your index finger will, will be uh, V and W, and your middle finger will be, will be a new vector, which is, is orthogonal to them. And that's exactly the vector coming from the cross product. So here, my green one, which is orthogonal to, to uh, the black one and the blue one is the cross product. So the cross product is kind of the orthogonal vector while um, the corresponding element in the exterior algebra, it's not really an element, it's a sum of elements. And you should think about it as more like being, well, instead of writing down um, uh, a vector orthogonal to it, I could also write, kind of write down the plane where my, my vector V and W live. And the plane that I get, this two dimensional object, that's basically um, the, the corresponding exterior product. So the difference between the cross product and, and the exterior product is that the exterior product of, of two vectors is, is a two dimensional object while um, the cross product is a one dimensional object, but they kind of encode the same information. Because of course, if I know the plane where everything lives in, then I can also, uh, also know an, uh, a vector orthogonal to it. And if I have an orthogonal vector, then I could write down the orthogonal plane. And the signs encode basically that I could pull the vector the other way around. My vector could also point downwards, or I can orient my, um, my my plane the other way around. Actually, this one goes from it goes from black to to blue because that's that's kind of the order I've chosen in this example. Um, so you can think of elements in the exterior algebra as encoding so um, degree one elements. I will explain in a second what a degree is, but basically polynomials of degree one. They are like vectors. Polynomials of degree two like, are like areas. Polynomials of degree three are like volumes and so on and so on. In a very natural sense that you that we will discuss in, 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 a, in a second. It has to do with cross products. It has to do with determinants, as we will see. But abstractly, and maybe really the thing you should keep in mind is they are just polynomials with anti-commuting variables. OK. Um, before I show you the formal definition, let's just let's just get a little bit more familiar with it. Let's just, just count the number of polynomials. Right? Counting is something I hope all of us like. Uh, and I just write x to the k for polynomials of degree k. Okay? Just to get started, let's just, just do it. X to the zero, polynomials of degree zero up to scalars are, well, is just the trivial polynomial, so only scalar polynomials. Right? Everything here is just up to scalar, so you could also write five if you want. Five is a, is a totally legal polynomial, it just doesn't have any variables at all, but yeah, whatever. Anyway, um, up to scalar, there's just one. In other words, the dimension is one of the corresponding uh, degree zero part, and this is, this is the degree k part. This was really bad. This is a degree k part. OK, um, a, little, a little bit more exciting. So what are degree 1 polynomials? Well, I can see three of them, x1, x2, x3. And there's nothing else you can do up to taking linear combinations. So this one is included, for example, uh, because it's just a linear combination of, of those guys. And the, 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 the formal terminology is it's spent by, right? So this is what I'm always writing. It's spent by. So I basically write down the basis for the corresponding degree. And this just means the degree is three. Uh, sorry, the, the dimension of the space is three. Let's try to write down degree two polynomials. Well, I can write down x1, x2. Okay. I can write down x1, x3. And I can write down x2, x3. 
And for example, x3, x2 is already included because it's just minus x2, x3. And x1 squared is zero, as I said before. So that doesn't exist. So the only thing you can write down are kind of uh, mixed polynomials. So never two variables at once, never, never the same variable twice. And you could pick an order for them. Because if they're out of order, you can swap them, picking up some sign. But anyway, you could swap them until they're in order. And you will get there three of them. So again, you get dimension three. And now comes the, 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 the crucial step. So um, since squares are always zero, the only polynomial of degree three, which I can write down, is basically x1. I can't write down x1 again. So I have to write down x2. I can't write down x1 or x2 again. So I have to write down x3. So that's only one. And you see this nice symmetry going on here between, um, between the x. And it really just comes from, from the binomial coefficient. It's, it's really nice. So the, the, the dimension of the, the case exterior power is just n over k. 3 over 0, 3 over 1, 3 over 2, 3 over 3. And they have exactly the symmetry. Um, uh, around around some middle middle axis. So this is actually a finite dimensional thing. So in, in principle, you could write down any polynomial, but it, it, it becomes finite dimensional really because you never can write down anything squared. So if you have 500 variables and you look at the fifth hundred degree, right, um, you can only write down any element once and that's it. So it will, there will be exactly one element of the corresponding degree. Um, the formal definition is using um, tensor algebras, uh, not so really, not, not so important, but you basically, it, it's really what I said, you impose a relation that variables commute, which in the kind of the, the standard notation will look like this. And in a lot of cases, people just write down x wedge y instead of just x y. Um, like I did, to remind themselves that actually you have a sign, right? So X, Y looks a little bit, well, maybe it, it, it might be a little bit misleading because it looks like a polynomial, but actually it should be minus Y, X, right? Um, and in order to remind yourself that you're, you're working with minuses, you would write down X wedge Y equals minus Y wedge x. So don't be too confused by those wedge symbols. They're just a reminder that you're not working with polynomials, but with anti-groups of polynomials. A lot of people get confused by those wedge symbols because it's just another symbol. And it's maybe a little bit over the top to use it, but it's just really just a reminder that you're working with polynom uh, anti-commutative polynomials and not polynomials. Um, yeah, so it, it, it really just a polynomial ring in non-commutative variables. And you can do this for any vector space. So if you do it for a vector space, it just means, um, so let's say V, it just means to choose some basis of V, whatever, X1 up to Xn. And then you have non-commuting uh, polynomials in those variables. That's it. So you can write down polynomials in vectors. And how do you do that? Well, you can do it like this. For instance, and I'm now using the batch notation because I'm using both notations on this slide actually. But um, in, in a wedge notation, for instance, you can have uh, AC wedge BD, which is a wedge of two, two vectors. How do you do that? Well, you ex express it in terms of um, the standard basis. And the standard basis, you should think of as being X and Y, two variables, so X and Y. Or in, in sorry, in my notation, actually X1 and X2. And the way you wedge them is exactly as the multiplication for those variables. Namely, you would get, well, the diagonal dies and you will get the off diagonal in order. AD minus BC. And it turns out that this is exactly the determinant. That's, that's what it is, right? It's AD minus BC. And the only thing I did is I took this vector as the first column and I took the second column as vectors and I just called them a times x1 
as vectors or as polynomials plus c times x2. And I should have put this in blue. Let me put it in blue. And I took the other one, um, b times x1 plus d times x2. And I multiplied them together using, using the anti-commutation, the variables anti-commute rule. And I get exactly the term. And people would say, that's maybe something you have seen, the determinant is a scalar in front of this unique element. The only thing you can write down, right, of length n, I say it again, if you can only put every variable once because x, xi squared is zero, and you can put all, any variable just once, um, then you can think of the determinant as being the corresponding scalar in front of the, this element, this unique element, if you wedge um, the, the vectors corresponding to the, to the columns of your matrix together. And what you really should do is, you, again, I said again, the wedge looks terrifying, looks scary. It isn't. It's just a reminder that you're working with anti-commuting polynomials. So you can also just be like me and say, I don't care for wedges, and I just write down polynomials, and then I, I kind of keep it in the back of my head that um, they anti-commute, and then you just do your usual multiplication of polynomials and see what you get. And what you get will be the determinant. Okay. Um, thank you very much for listening and see you next time.